All right, the Estates General meets in 1789. This is the year of the French Revolution. It starts off on a good note, democracy and representation, and it will end in bloodshed. 1789, the king has called for the Estates General. What are they? Well, there are three of uh, the estates. They haven't met since 1614, since the time of Louis XIII, when Louis XIII was a boy with a regency, and Cardinal Richelieu made a name for himself. Well, it's a feudal thing. This goes back to the feudal days. It is representation. There actually is democracy in France. They just don't use it, again, to compare it to England's parliament. England's parliament dates back from the uh, Magna Carta in feudal times that the English have forced their kings to call parliament. Well, France had a parliament system on the Estates General. They just don't use it. There are three estates, the Estates General, lean, meaning the three estates meeting together. Well, in the first estate, or house, an estate like a house, is the clergy, the Catholic Church. And I'm referring to priests, bishops, abbots, cardinals, high-ranking members who've taken men, who've taken the orders. The clergy will hold elections, elect their representatives. And just to point out to you how powerful the Catholic Church is, they own 10% of the land of France and how wealthy they are. And that's the good land of France. So the priests and bishops and cardinals will cast their votes for their representatives to come to Versailles. The second estate is the nobility, people who hold some sort of noble title. They have to prove it when they come to vote. They have to bring their noble, noble heritage with them. They own about 20% of the land of France, and again, that's the good land of France, good farmland they've possessed for, for centuries, some of them. Well, there are two different types, actually. You like, see some animosity among the, no, the, the nobility here. The old nobles are nobles of the sword. Their heritage dates back to the days when nobles used to fight. And then the nobles of the robe. These are the new nobles, going back to the times of Louis XIV, 15th, and 16th, nobles who have proven themselves in government. They wear robes in their job, and then they are ennobled at the end of their service, possibly. So there's some animosity here between these two types of nobles. In the third estate is going to be everybody else. If you're not in the first estate or the second estate, you'll be voting in the third estate. 97% of the population, or 95, depending on what book you read, 95, 97, somewhere in there, percent of the population. That's pretty much everyone that's not of the church or of a nobility. Well, who are we looking at? 21 million peasants. France is the most populous country in Europe. France is quite agricultural and green. And then a small middle class, it's not a dominant middle class, but it's going to be an important middle class, one million bourgeoisie. And that's where you're going to see your representation. The representation is going to come out of the bourgeoisie. So the Estates General meets in May of 1789. They've been voting in 1788, and then they come to meet in 1789. That was a terrible winter, as the French were considering their voting and considering democracy. It was a terrible winter, a lot of famine in that winter. So that uh, brought a lot of contempt for the government. The government is just ground to a halt. There's also a lot of uh, jockeying, a lot of uh, politicking going on. A very famous pamphlet came out in 1788 into 1789. It's called, What is the Third Estate? That will get your attention. If you're getting ready to vote in the Third Estate, it definitely get your attention. What are we doing here? What is the Third Estate? It was written by a churchman, an abbot named Sayez. Again, I'm going to point out to you that a lot of churchmen are of the Enlightenment. They recognize that some France needs a better form of government. And so this abbot wrote a pamphlet, easy to read pamphlet. He'll ask a question and answer it in a very simple form. What is the third estate? And the answer is everything. It's 97% of the population. What has it been in history? Nothing. It's always outvoted. The other two estates will always outvote the, outvote the third estate. What should it be? It should be competitive. It should be the representation of France. What does he want? Doubling the third. If the third estate can be doubled to match the first and second estate, then you could have a good democratic system of government. And the king actually granted this. As we go in the, the, the Christmas of 1788, the king actually heard this movement. Again, he wants to be popular. And he heard this movement about doubling the third. And he announced that the third, third estate would have double representation. But there's a question there about having twice as many representatives. That would be great if you vote by head, if the first, second, and third state all meet together and vote by individual person, by head. But if you still vote by a state, you're still going to be outvoted two to one. It'll always be two to one if it's by a state. 
The only solution, if you're going to double the third, which is now done, is to vote by head to where the, all the people meet together and you'll have an equal number of third estate equal to the first and second estate. That's never clarified going into the estates general. The meeting will be held at Versailles. All these people will be coming to Versailles. And we know they have very high hopes. Many of them keep diaries, and we have these diaries, and we have all kinds of accounts, and many of them will publish articles to newspapers. Lots of newspapers will be hopping up here in the French Revolution. And we know they were very excited about this, very high hopes for the good of France. No one's talking revolution here. Everyone's talking about changing government. A new enlightened form of government is bound to take place. And again, they've watched America form. America has created 1787, our Constitution, with a balance of power, with three branches. And a lot of them come in with, hey, this is the way France needs to be done, not as a republic, but with a king and a, a states general, maybe, and a court system and checks and balances. They also come in with a list of grievances. Many people have been um, writing up lists of grievances. Here's something we want to fix about France. And so this gives us a good insight into what's wrong with France. Um, they don't complain about Louis the Sixteenth and these grievances. They're mainly complaining about feudalism, that feudalism's got to go. These oppressive laws, these oppros oppressive arbitrary laws of nobles have got to go. They just want reforms. They want to fix France. They want a equality of taxation and representation. There's also a lot of drawings. You know, most people in France can't read, but you could certainly understand a drawing. Here's the three estates. This man here would be of the nobility with his flowers and feathers in his hair. And this man here will be of the church wearing his church outfit. And uh, who's the third estate? Well, the third estate is carrying the other two. The third estate is crippled, having to walk with a cane as he's carrying the other two estates. In other words, we need to fix this. Get off of our back. Here's another one, the three estates. Here's a noble, nobleman there. There's a churchman there. And they seem quite surprised as now the third estate is starting to get on its feet. There's starting to be some representation now. And there's fear in the nobility and fear in the church as the third estate is starting to take off its chains and get on its feet. So the Estates General meets in the spring of 1789. At the opening ceremonies, um, the third estate is kind of humiliated as they get to see the churchmen go in and they get to see the nobles and all their finery go in. And then the third estate walks in just kind of somberly without a whole lot of fanfare. The king gives a speech to them. And he basically tells them that they now need to separate. You know, he announces the problems of France. It's taxation. We're bankrupt. And now you need to separate into your three estates and review, review your credentials. What about the meeting altogether? He had doubled the third estate. The third estate has double representation. But if they meet as three separate houses, the representation means nothing then. They'll be outvoted by the church and the nobles. And so this is where the third estate starts the French Revolution. They refuse. With the king right in front of them, they refuse to obey this. They refuse to separate into a third estate and be seen that way as a third estate. And you start seeing some leaders emerge. Some men start to step up and make speeches about how this is the time now. You know, France is broken. Now's the time for us to reach up. Men like Lafayette. Lafayette, a nobleman, will give a speech. He'll come in front of the third estate and give a speech about how now is the time. This is, you know, I've been to America. I've seen what America's done, and now we can do this. A man named Mirabeau, um, a nobleman, kind of questionable nobility, but a nobleman comes over and, again, joins the third estate to say, hey, this is the time. This is the time for all these houses to unite. And uh, a churchman, the Abbe Sayez, the man who wrote that pamphlet, comes over to the third estate to say, hey, many churchmen are with you. And they would be. Many churchmen elected are actually priests, and they knew the problems of the third estate. The answer of the third estate is to not separate into a separate house, but to delay, delay, delay. The longer this rolls on, France is bankrupt. The king needs a solution. The country is ground to a halt. And if we refuse to act, then he can't do anything. They eventually proclaim themselves the National Assembly of France on June 17th, about a month in, a month of nothing getting done. They eventually proclaim themselves the National Assembly, that they are the National Assembly. They're not the third estate. They're not a third wheel. They're the National Assembly of France. Why? 
because they represent 97% of the population. The people have elected them as the representatives of France, and they call for the first estate and the second estate to join them. Let's create a national assembly, the people of France, and they want a constitution. Let's sit down and write a constitution, clearly defining a new form of government for France. That's quite a, quite a move. This, this should be their day. The June 17th should be the day of French history here, French Revolution. Uh, and another one comes up shortly thereafter. Uh, the king actually locks them out of their house. They were meeting in a place, and the king actually puts a guard and a lock on the door. And uh, on June 20th, they show up to this locked room, and they agree that we cannot let the king do this to us. We've got to meet somewhere. They find a tennis court. They actually meet on a tennis court, an indoor tennis court, court, and, they court and they all meet there and uh, angry at the king and sit down or stand up and swear an oath that this third estate, we will not be disbanded. We are the National Assembly, and we must have a constitution to swear to not be disbanded, and France must have a constitution. This is the famous tennis court, oath, tennis court oath. This should be a great day in the French Revolution. This should be there the day they celebrate the famous tennis court oath. On a tennis court, everyone swearing an oath, crowd up in the bleachers, a mob of the, th of the what used to be the third estate and many churchmen and many nobles there swearing that they will never be disbanded until they have a, um, a new constitution and a national assembly. Well, the national assembly, um, finally the king just gives in. On June 27th, he announces that uh, it doesn't matter to him anymore. The three estates can meet together. He doesn't really care. Um, it's at this point that uh, there's a lot of cheering, hooray. Um, there's also some people getting out of town. A lot of members of the uh, clergy begin to pack their bags. They kind of see something bad coming here. And a lot of nobles decide, I'm not meeting with the, the commoners. And so they head home. Well, Louis XVI might appear to have given in, but we know now that behind the scenes he was not planning to give in. He decided actually to get tough. He was going to break this National Assembly. He brings in some new ministers. That was announced and frightened some people that he brings in some new, very conservative, very reactionary nobles to be his new ministers. And he begins to call in the troops. Word would, lead, would, would come in pretty quickly that, hey, there are troops coming. You know, the orders have been sent out to various troops around France to come to Versailles. He's bringing the troops to disband the National Assembly. Well, in order to get to Versailles, a lot of these troops will actually have to pass through Paris on the way. So there's troops marching through Paris on their way to Versailles. And that's when Paris explodes. The date is July 14th, and that's going to be the date of the French Revolution, the date they will celebrate, the date that Paris went crazy as these troops are marching through. Mobs begin to attack various government facilities, looking for guns, looking for ways to defend themselves. They'll find some guns. And then they go off to attack the Bastille, a prison. Many people are there to attack the, the prisons, an ancient feudal prison right in the middle of Paris, looming dark towers of a prison right in the middle of Paris. Uh, there's also gunpowder there. The ones who knew what they were doing are actually there to get the gunpowder, or they think there's gunpowder there. So they begin to attack this. Mobs begin to show up and attack this prison, this huge looming prison, and they have to get through this gatehouse here, and uh, shots are fired. The, at the garrison at the prison, there's only 20, maybe 20 guards there, but shots are fired. People shooting up at the guards and guards shooting down. There's some blood spilled. And then eventually the mob actually gets through these gates and there's a couple of drawbridges that the guards put down for some reason. And the mob actually gets into the prison and kills the guards. There's about 20 of them there. Kill, uh, tears the prison co commandant limb from limb and uh, set free the prisoners. There were about seven prisoners there uh, for various offenses like forging or uh, their family had put them there. In other words, and no iron masks in this prison. So uh, a little bit of disappointment there, but uh, it's uh, the symbol of, the f of France, that the people have risen up and knocked down a symbol of royal despotism and royal authority. So this is Bastille Day, the France's national holiday, July 14th. Well, it has some uh, pretty important results. Paris now takes the lead. Forget about the National Assembly now. It's about Paris. Paris takes the lead here. They saved the revolution with guns. They now begin to create military units. They will create a National Guard. 
people with guns, people with shops, wealthy people. You have to actually provide your own uniform and your own weapons here. So this isn't the poor people of Paris. This is the wealthy people of Paris will join the National Guard and uh, mostly middle class. And they choose a leader and they choose Lafayette. If you were a betting man at this time, you'd be betting that, hey, Lafayette's going to be the man. Lafayette will be the George Washington of France. Um, you will be disappointed also. Um, he will fail at pretty much everything he does um, it's, as he's trying to possibly take over France. Um, it's at this point now also the violence in Paris that a lot of nobles who have already left the National Assembly um, decide to take a vacation at another country, pack the family up and leave. Thousands of nobles will begin to immigrate and they'll be known as immigres out of France going to other countries, getting out of the country of France for a while. Let's see what happens because all hell's breaking loose. There's no rules. The government's coming crashing down. Um, a couple of days after July 14th, there'll be some other murders of nobles. If they catch a noble in the street, sometimes they'll lynch them or cut their head off and put their heads on pikes. You can see a couple of heads on pikes. This becomes the symbol of the French Revolution, a head on pikes and people dancing underneath it and entrails and body parts being ripped apart of these nobles. So maybe if you're a noble now would actually would be a good time to leave uh, France. 